by definition, a slave is a person that is disarmed. For too long, African Americans have been on the wrong side of the gun. From the racial motivation of slavery, to the white supremacy movement, to today's escalating black on black crime. The politically correct view that a disarmed black community is a safe community is only safe for those who seek control. The black community went from being disarmed, being mistreated, being enslaved because of a lack of access to guns, ultimately went through a period of saying, aha, we have the right to bear arms, we're gonna make sure it's respected, to a period where now the gun is the main tool of maintenance of the narco economy, which is the only economy in the African American community. 400 years of injustice. 400 years of being on the wrong side of the gun. It's time for change. Why is the gangbanger who has the Saturday night special in his pocket given more rights than the average everyday citizen, even though he was illegally armed, he has a right to defend himself and you have not the ability to defend yourself. So if the law says that I can't buy a certain gun, that if I can't carry a gun a certain way, I abide by that because I'm law abiding. But the criminals are the ones that carry, buy any type of guns that they want and are empowered. The basic right of every American is the right to self-defense. Take away that right and the individual is powerless. It's not unusual for America in its long history to disarm or seek to disarm undesirable populations. Gun control laws have kept African Americans in their place for hundreds of years. From the earliest days of slavery up until the mid-1800s, blatantly written gun control laws prohibited slaves and freed slaves from owning firearms. Be it further enacted that if any Negro shall presume to carry arms whatsoever, he shall be whipped with 21 lashes. With the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1866, African Americans were given the right to bear arms. But new laws were written in such a way to exclude blacks from purchasing guns. The greatest service the authorities can render the city now is to disarm every Negro, search every Negro house, and arrest everyone who is... Inexpensive handguns were banned, or high taxes were imposed to keep guns out of the financial reach of a mostly poor black community. There's been various statues throughout every state that had sizable African-American populations after slavery to restrict through black codes the ability for blacks to be armed. In 1941, Florida Supreme Court Justice Buford declared the original 1893 Florida Gun Control Act was passed with the purpose of disarming Negro laborers. The statute was never intended to be applied to the white population. In the 1960s, when armed blacks took to the streets in the race riots in Los Angeles, Newark, and Chicago, the laws were once again rewritten. In a futile attempt to curb the violence, Congress passed the 1968 Gun Control Act. Public outcry for the restrictions of guns after the assassinations of Dr. Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy hid the true purpose of the legislation. It was Robert Sherrill writing on the 1968 legislation who stated that it was really an attempt to restrict arms for black people. Championed by Senator Thomas Dodd and signed into law by President Johnson, the 68 Gun Control Act 
used shrewdly crafted language to give the authorities control to dictate who could and who could not own a firearm and what types of firearms Americans can own. Thomas Dodd from Connecticut, a Connecticut Yankee, goes to Library of Congress and gets the actual gun act that the Nazis had passed in 1938, and he has it translated into English. The 68 Gun Control Act was written and in some cases almost copied word for word from the same laws the Nazis used in 1938 to control undesirable populations in Hitler's Germany. Both documents categorize and restrict firearms to certain individuals. Both documents are based on racial fear. And so they take this document and they use it to draft legislation to start requiring more licensing and more constriction of the right to keep and bear arms. When I found out what the restrictions were, I was very surprised. Each town, each police chief has the discretion of whether to give a license or not. There is just not one set rule. It seems that a lot of black people, and especially young black men, are held to a higher standard. Maybe you have a, a drunk driving record, and that would be enough to disqualify you. Where legally it's not. It's not a felony conviction. Whereas maybe somebody from the suburbs that's white and maybe from a more influential family would have the same exact record as you do, but would not be denied. It's kind of subtle discrimination. It seems unthinkable today that legislation is still being written to keep minorities in their place, but it is. Purchasing a firearm requires the applicant to fill out a federal form to verify their race. Restrictive gun laws, gun bans, warrantless searches of public housing, and the confiscation of firearms in major cities continue to deprive minorities of their right to protect and defend themselves. Violence is increasing. The number of gun-related deaths is increasing yearly. So it should be rather obvious that the gun laws are not working because things are not getting better. They're making more and more laws and it's getting worse. Gun control has not worked. The federal government's own Centers for Disease Control can't show conclusive evidence that reducing guns reduces violence. Yet, these facts are dismissed. Historically, more guns in the hands of decent, law-abiding citizens has had the opposite effect. In 1964, the desegregation of Jonesboro, Louisiana High School was threatened by local authorities with fire hoses. Four armed black men arrived with loaded shotguns. Without firing a shot, the mob dispersed and the authorities retreated. The students entered the school without incident. Those men were members of the Deacons for Defense an armed citizens militia founded in Jonesboro, Louisiana. The deacons were everyday citizens who by 1965 had organized into more than 50 chapters throughout the South in self-defense from the Ku Klux Klan. In 1964, down in Louisiana, there were all types of demonstrations going on by Freedom Riders. Many times, the demonstrations would be met by armed white resistance people were dying and being shot and intimidated because they were unarmed. And basically, because they were unarmed, they were also being denied the right to vote. The deacons protected civil rights workers for CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, who were registering voters in Louisiana and Mississippi. They patrolled black neighborhoods and protected black churches where CORE was holding voting rights seminars. These were regular, everyday people. They were not some paramilitary group. The thing that made them different is they were veterans from the Korean War. They were veterans from World War II. And so they did have the training and they did have the discipline that came from being veterans. <laughs> 